Welcome. Welcome everybody to our lunchtime webinar. It's day five coming toward the end of the webinar program for Churches Count in Nature uh, and all around the country this week and right on until um, this coming weekend churches uh, people from churches are going out into their churchyards and recording the wonderful plants and trees and insects and birds that they see there please do join in perhaps over the weekend pop out to a churchyard near you and record what you can see and whilst churches count on nature has been going on all around the country we've been running our national program of webinars all about different aspects of land and nature and today's session from Andy from Arosha is about urban hope how to create space for nature and community in a small space very few of us own a large estate or our own allotments or nature reserve but it's still entirely possible even a very small urban space to transform it for nature and in doing so provide a place where mental and physical health can be improved as well so we're going to be hearing lots about what that might look like and how to do it from Andy. So we're here on the highlighted webinar. We've got one more of our Land and Nature series this afternoon, and we're finishing with the big picture from Pete Brotherton, who's the Director of Research at Natural England. And he will be talking about from global to local, tackling the joint crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. So do please come along at four o'clock today if you can. And then we turn our mind back to net zero carbon. We've got a session in mid-June on the new faculty rules, session in September on how parish buying and two by two can support parishes through central procurement of things like energy audits and solar panels. And I've just booked in two sessions on electric heating solutions, which will be happening early in October. Housekeeping uh, today, as usual, we're using the Q&A for the questions rather than the chat. So please do find the Q&A. That's where you type your question in. You can see other people's questions. You can click the thumbs up against the ones that you're most interested in. And those ones will rise to the top. Uh, I'll send everybody after we finish the slides and any links that are shared in the chat. And I'm recording the session and all of the recordings of the 10 webinars will be on our website. Uh, the first three days are already up there and yesterday and today's will go on early next week. Oh, dear me, I haven't changed this slide. This is this is who was here for yesterday afternoon. Oh, very sorry. Look, I'll flick back and then you won't spot my mistake. Um, Andy Lester is here, the head of conservation for Arosha, uh, and very, very expert in everything to do with ecology and churches. Right, let me stop sharing my screen and then we can hand over to Andy who can lead us away. Thank you, Catherine, for the uh, warm introduction. Lovely to see a good group of people here today and uh, that you've chosen to be here with us rather than outside enjoying a, a rare dose of June sunshine. It's actually quite pleasant down here. Uh, just outside the forest. So I'm just going to go into my share screen function and uh, just set this up and then uh, we will be away. Um, bear with me a second. Uh, can we see that, Catherine? No, not yet. At the moment, we've still just let got... Me just, let me just go back and check that. Uh, that's that's looking more hopeful. I can see your file manager there. All right, this again it is being annoying. Here we go. This looks better. That looks much better. There we go. Is that all right, Catherine? We'll see it. Fantastic. Good. The lovely, lovely joys of technology. So uh, a warm welcome to the session today. And just just two things. First of all, to add to the housekeeping is obviously use the function to add questions into the chat. But as often happens, you may suddenly come up with a question after the talk's finished. Um, and if you do want to send me any questions, any thoughts, any comments, it's andy.lester at arosha.org. Nice and simple, andy.lester at arosha.org. And I will pick any uh, late comments or thoughts up at the end. Why the picture at the beginning? Uh, it just is a little bit of inspiration for me. I think we are in a season now, aren't we, where we know how challenging the crisis is and there's a longing sometimes just to go outside and make a difference and I love this picture this is the inspiring picture of a prophet turning the desert into a space of joy and beauty and abundance and I'm hoping to share 
a little bit of that sense of joy, beauty and abundance with you today. So let's make a start, and uh, I'm going to start with something really positive, and that is there is real hope out there. I did a quick troll yesterday of some of the initiatives that just in the UK alone and came up with this as a, a list of things that are happening. And there are some new areas which I find particularly inspiring, especially food forests and urban forests and vertical gardens. Uh, and a huge expansion of forest churches and forest schools and quiet zones. A lot of nature reserves are now talking a lot about creating spaces where people can meditate and pray and reflect rather than just feel they've got to talk. So there's a lot of good things happening out there. And we're going to go through some of these areas uh, through the course of the next 50 minutes or so. But before we go into the detail, let me go through some urban facts and some urban myths. Uh, first of all, a few facts. Um, over half of us live in urban areas. Actually, in the UK, it's, it's higher than the global average. It's nearly 85%. So whilst many of us aspire to be in beautiful green spaces, the vast majority of us don't get those opportunities. And yet our urban gardens are some of the best spaces for nature. And you'll see a slide in a bit that shows an area of allotments in Sheffield. And they did a survey of 100 gardens there and counted a massive 5,000 species. And as we become more urban based, we've continued our disconnect for nature. Uh, recent surveys by the government suggest that only one in 10 five to 15 year olds spend an hour or more outside each week which is a pretty shocking statistic. And then what of the cities? Well, major cities occupy just 3% of the world's land surface area and yet use over half the planet's available resources. As you'll see from the fourth fact on the screen, the reality here is that we don't have a huge amount of space to play with for land. Uh, UK residents, though, have quite a bit more. The average Asian resident less than 90 square meters. What about urban myths? Well, one of the common urban myths is that they are worse for wildlife than our countryside. They can be, but with imagination and with creativity and with the right people and the right imaginations, you can do extraordinary things. Second is that you will often hear in the newspaper and the media that we're running out of space because of the spread of towns in the country. Again, the vast majority of space in Britain remains rural, uh, and it is interesting that it is in our rural spaces where some of the most depleted landscapes exist. Third myth is that there are far too few urban conservation projects to make a real difference in our cities. As you will see in a few moments, that too is not the case. And then a fourth myth, that there's not much we can do to individually make a difference. Um, I'm a profound believer that individual actions, when put together, can do extraordinary things. And the last bit is that there aren't speeches that need our towns and cities. Well, that's not true too. For those of you who were here in the beginning, you might have heard Catherine mention the peregrines on St Albans Cathedral, one of a number of cathedrals that are now positively encouraging these amazing birds of prey to come and enjoy. And that's because there aren't enough uh, cliffs in the right places for them to breed on. So they're turning to our towns and cities and cathedrals are one of the best vertical spaces. So we're going to make a start of our journey by looking at a few of the species that make our urban areas so important. We're not going to spend a huge long time on this uh, because I want to focus a lot of our attention on what can we actually do? What are our actions? But let's take you on a, a quick tour as some of the most amazing wildlife in Britain and their connection with our urban areas and especially our churches. Our churches are fundamentally important spaces uh, for urban nature. This is a picture of a house martin. It gets its name from St Martin and St Martin's Day, as you know, is early in the year in March and it coincides, their arrival in Europe uh, in March coincides almost day to day with St Martin's Day and indeed it got its name, the Martin family got the name from St Martin. The average house martin nest has about well, between 900 and 1000 daubs of mud 
and they take the mud and mix it with saliva and it goes rock solid and they painstakingly glue the nest to an eave and then lay their eggs into that and a typical house martin will produce three babies. Sources of mud are getting harder to find and with climate changing the mud is often too hard to create daubs of uh, or it gets really stormy and wet and the nests collapse. So increasingly um, uh, many towns and cities are advising their residents to help house martins by creating temporary nests. But it's one bird that loves towns, has an association with houses, likes proximity to people and uh, are in a free fall decline across much of Europe. So they need our help. So a symbol of hope and a symbol of the need for help. Uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, the peregrine. Um, German surveyors a few days ago managed to time a peregrine in Stuttgart, uh, pouncing on a feral pigeon at over 200 miles an hour, uh, nearly breaking the uh, speed recording device that they were using. An incredible bird. Uh, you can tell the male and the female apart. This is a female, the female are larger, the male are quite a bit smaller but an extraordinary hunter and brilliant for pest control around churches and cathedrals. So something to encourage, not discourage. Another bird that's come into our towns and cities as a result of climate change is this, it's a little egret. What an incredible bird it is. And they've spread the kind of silent colonizer over the last 30 years to thousands of pairs. And they're now nesting as far up into the UK as Southwest Scotland and Northumberland. Now, you won't see this in the UK, but it's another bird that's really associated with towns and cities. They're weaver birds. And this is the spotback weaver of South Africa. Uh, and it shows the nest building going on. Now we can't quite see in the picture here um, and it doesn't quite do it justice, but some of the plants that they've included in their nest are made of plastic um, and it's a bird that has adapted to taking on rubbish in its nest building. So whilst I don't advocate plastic as a great solution for our urban areas, uh, we do see on occasion nature adapting ridiculously well to the silly things that we throw at it. And so again, it's a bit of a symbol of hope in the mess of our world. And the final bird I want to just show you is the bee eater. It is one of my favourites. And this picture, I, I hasten to add, was not recorded in an urban area. I just like the image. But this one was. And uh, this tells a little bit sort of a story about where I want to take the rest of this hour. This bee eater is taken on some barbed wire. Directly behind it and under it, uh, is a minefield. You're actually looking at the city of Aleppo and a team from Arosha were out there looking at a possible conservation project. And there was this sense of brokenness and despair. The tower block that you see behind you, you might be able to get an idea of, had not a single pane of glass left in it. The buildings beneath it were unable to, the people of those buildings, unable to access the parkland that was immediately in front where you can see the trees because of fear of mines. And yet this bee eater was a symbol of hope, able to fly over it, able to provide color, a beautiful call, and a way of saying that even in some of the darkest spaces in our broken urban towns and cities, uh, there is hope. And so it's a case of press pause here. And we recognize that as we're thinking about how can we create space for nature and community and climate restoration here in the UK. We spare a thought for those in the war-torn cities of Ukraine and the Middle East, parts of South America as well, and, and parts of Southeast Asia, where there is a deep need for hope in urban areas. And so what we do here can inspire and equip others in some of those broken spaces. And so as we dig, as we plant, as we sow, we do it prayerfully and thoughtfully, remembering what is going on with our brothers and sisters in some of the most troubled parts of the world. Oh, and yes, there's the common swift, the bird that never lands. Uh, it does in its average journey in a lifetime, a typical swift, 
will fly the equivalent of to the moon and back 10 times. It'll spend its entire six to seven years of its life on the wing. Only the female will lay land to lay eggs and house sparrow to a familiar site. We move on to some animals and you're thinking, well, we're not going to find that in the UK. No, this is a coyote, um, but another animal that has grown in its association with areas where urban parks and gardens are restored in the US. A beautiful creature that I've had a few close encounters with, but that's another story. And here, as farming has changed, our badger community have moved into our towns and cities as well. Uh, this one was taken in the middle of Bristol and it's they're not everybody's cup of tea for different reasons. And of course, from a farming community point of view, they can cause some challenges, but they are a beautiful creature. Our, our largest of the smaller non-deer mammals in the UK, other than fox, uh, and one that is increasingly associated with healthy urban areas. Another one that we associate with our towns and cities, but is battling for survival because of climate change, is hedgehogs. So when we are doing incre incredible things in our churchyards and in our gardens at home and in our, and in our little back, backyards at home, uh, this is one creature that we spare a thought for and try and think creatively about how we can create space for it. But it's not just the mammals and the birds, but of course it's the insects and the plants as well. And our, our urban areas can be some of the most rich spaces for insects. I did a little straw poll. This is terrible science. And as a scientist, I, I admit that it's not very factually accurate, but it's an interesting one anyway. I was in West Highlands uh, three weeks ago with a colleague looking at a rewilding project and drove back through Glasgow. So I drove through Glasgow, the thing that struck me with a sheer number of insects. I estimated about 5,000 insects hit my window between the highlands and the lowlands of Scotland, including the city of Glasgow. And I thought, what's going on here? This is very interesting. And Glasgow has painted itself as uh, one of the leading net carbon zero cities in the UK. That's what they're aiming for. And part of it is by creating big new verge projects, new woodland projects, new wild flower meadow projects, rewilding gardens, and insect life and plant life is responding. Between Lancaster and London, on the next stage of the drive, I cleaned my windscreen at Lancaster and not one insect landed on the windshield. Now, to my mind, that, that hurt because I thought, isn't it interesting that if a city takes on the mission of transforming small spaces for people and nature, it's not about the size of the individual transformation, it's what we collectively do that matters then change can happen. But many places have not bought into that yet. But if you do, you will get beauty. Now, for many who are out there listening to this, you may wince slightly and think, but he's just shown two pictures of non-native flowers. Well, let me tell you this. Whilst I'm an ecologist, I'm also a firm believer in beautiful garden spaces, which are full of pollinating species. Now, that can be a mixture of wild and endemic species and also non-native species that are adapting to climate change, are full of colour, full of nectar, full of life and are non-invasive. I would hasten to add what you don't want to do is bring in invasive species or plant non-native into your wild flower meadows. But in your garden spaces, go for it, be experimental, take risks, uh, take advice, and be creative because our wildlife needs help like never before. And of course, it's not just the insects and the flowers, the mammals and the birds, but the reptiles too. And one of my favorite species of all is grass snake. They look formidable. They grow quite long. Uh, I've seen ones over three feet and yet uh, non-venomous, uh, but a brilliant pest control of your gardens for rats and mice. So if you've got compost heaps, a great space for grass snakes to hibernate uh, and to come out in spring and summer and to feed. So that is a, a 15 minute, less than 15 minute whistle stop tour of the wildlife of our urban areas. So we're now gonna split the rest of the talk into three bits. And the first bit is talking about what we can do, what's broken. And 
Um, this picture was taken seven years ago uh, on an area called Woolfields. Um, some of you may know this space, but it is a, uh, a it was a heroin dealing area, three and a half acres in, in West London. And at one stage it was waist deep in rubbish right across that site. We had animal carcasses. In fact, I took this picture because uh, and for those of you who are slightly squeamish, I don't want to say too much other than those white bags towards the back of the picture are full of offal. We also found large quantities of asbestos and formica. We found cement. We found uh, a lot of drug dealing paraphernalia. Uh, and it's when you see a space that looks a bit helpless and hopeless, it's really easy to despair. It's really easy to look at what's broken and think, well, what on earth am I meant to do with this space? That could be incredible, but uh, can I really be bothered uh, to try and be part of the solution? This is taken just three years later, and here's a, a, an awesome work party who were out uh, doing a litter pick on the site, and you can see it's already beginning to transform. It's now an incredible space. We have a wildflower meadow, we have a sensory garden, we have two ponds, we have an orchard, we have a labyrinth, we have a wild art project, we have about uh, 5,000 visitors passing through it a year, 20 schools involved and 20 special needs groups. It's super exciting and just yesterday uh, we recruited our first education officer uh, from Africa uh, and he comes to us from the Met Police and he runs a food bank and he runs his own youth project for ex-drug offenders. We are really excited because you can take remarkably small spaces and do extraordinary things with it and it's it's like what I would call Kintsugi Hope. In Japanese pottery when you break something it's not a loss it's an opportunity you get gold leaf and lacquer and uh, glue and you put that broken pot that we saw earlier together with gold leaf and that pot increases in value it's not that you're trying to cover the scars and ignore them the brokenness is still important but it adds beauty to it so that's a little bit of what I think you're trying to do with with urban areas and what I want to do is now take us through some initiatives. We're going to go through some local initiatives, then we're going to take a look at some national projects that are going on. And then very importantly, what is it you can do as individuals, as people and members of the churches and as a community to take action for God and for nature? So let's start with the local urban. Uh, we're back here in West London, where uh, this was uh, four years ago, where one of the parts of the projects we were involved with on the same site was starting to prepare ground for food growing, uh, both to help feed local people, but also as a way of sharing and communicating with people of different backgrounds. I'm going to take you through the people left to right because it's quite fun. The guy on the left is an evangelical Christian. He's from a Pentecostal church and originally from South India. The gentleman to his right with the red turban on is Sikh. He, he was a blind Sikh. He was one of our most amazing volunteers. He lived in a house that had no land whatsoever. Uh, and he used this as his place to restore and heal and find hope. He died last year from COVID, but he died uh, in a place of incredible peace and I met him just a few weeks before he died and he said you know what this is the place I feel closest to God. The chap to the right of that is a Hindu from the uh, local um, local uh, Hindu temple. The chap with the long grey hair is an atheist, <laughs> he has no beliefs in anything at all and quite happy to tell everybody. The man to the right of that is a convert from Islam to Christianity, and the girl to the right of that comes from the local Baptist church. A more eclectic mix of people you could not have, but it's a reminder that as we are restoring nature in urban areas and in small spaces, one of the incredible things you can do is to build community space, and as you do so, 
build relationships with those who are fundamentally very different to you. And as Christians, that's what the Christian faith is all about. It's about sharing and learning from other cultures and other people. And then you can create incredible spaces. So this is a year later, and you can see our wildflowers blooming in the front, uh, relatively wildflowers I've hastened to add. But in the back right, you can see a proper wildflower meadow going on. And, and one of the things, give permission to local people uh, to get involved and help you design something that they feel they can really own. This was an outdoor uh, event in which we had worship <laughs> where half of the people there weren't even Christian and yet it was Christian worship and they were thoroughly enjoying it. I would just add that in my mind some of the most powerful examples of doing church is on urban green spaces that are being transformed by local community. It's an incredible tool of witness. It's an incredible symbol of hope and inspiration. For those of you who were on one of the earlier um, webinars this week, you will have heard uh, Reverend John White, a really good friend, talk about Hazelnut Community Farm, which has been an extraordinary inspiration from a blank sheet to a space in which community can engage at a very small scale in transforming spaces for people, for nature and for climate. If you didn't hear it, I believe, and Catherine can confirm this at the end, uh, there will be a recording of, of what John had to say. And may I really encourage you if, you, if you ever get a really bad day where you've listened to the news and the news from Ukraine is grim and the climate news is even worse uh, and Boris is, is saying things which uh, make us wince because he's not passionate enough about environment and climate, go and look at the website for Hazelnut Community Farm and you will be truly inspired. It's a wonderful local initiative. But it's not just at Hazelnut Community Farm where we're seeing extraordinary signs of hope. Uh, on this picture here, um, we're seeing two things. The first is uh, a picture taken from West Ger Western side of Germany where they're developing mental health paths. So people who have learning and other mental health challenges and creating multi-surface paths in parks where people can take their shoes off and experience nature in an urban environment. And they are ridiculously popular. It's been very popular through lockdown and the popularity has not diminished. Now that's great, but if you are a wheelchair user, you can see an inherent challenge with it. And so in the States, they've taken it one step further using recycled concrete, but creating flowering beds with different touches, scents and smells uh, so that you can reach out to a different community, people who are really struggling with mobility, uh, but are also wanting to really engage with nature and creating these vertical spaces that lift your eyes upwards. Uh, another fantastic and inspirational space. And I mentioned earlier about Sheffield. Uh, in this case, what's happening is they've decided to take all the fences around people's back gardens down and put them together into community space. So every house has its own little garden. And as an entire road, they thought, well, this is stupid. Let's, we're gonna get on a lot better with each other if we remove the fences. Bit of a planning nightmare, but what an extraordinary result. And that's the area that found 5,000 species of insects, birds, mammals, plants, uh, lichen, bats, you name it, they found it in that area. Uh, uh, it can be done. And taking barriers down is a fantastic way of reconnecting with community. Now, at the other end, uh, we all know that the Chinese like to do things at scale. Uh, and one of the challenges that we have is we often hear not great news from China on what they're doing on the environment, but actually they are super good in some areas at imagining what could be possible and in doing it. Uh, this is Fuzhou, and Fuzhou was China's first urban forest. Uh, they built a new city uh, and they wanted to create a space which incorporated a rewilding area, but one in which people didn't interfere with nature. So rather than having paths going through it, they decided to have paths that went over it. So the forest underneath is absolutely untouched. You don't get in, you can't go into it, uh, but you can walk over it. I thought that was really clever. Um, creating completely new vision of urban environments 
and by doing it, getting a whole new audience out to be inspired by it. At the other end of the scale, uh, there are an increasing number of churches and faith communities who are involved um, in creating spaces for sensory touch. And this one is at St. Clair's Church in County Durham, where they're creating a sensory garden, but specifically geared around young people and people with learning challenges. So everything around there is for people uh, to experience simplicity in sensory garden. They don't need to be complex spaces. Uh, and you can target particular groups who would really like to encounter nature in new ways. Uh, and some of you might recognize this and we'll come back to this. This is Todd Morden, uh, a, a very famous town in the UK that's become the center of food growing and rewilding on a tiny scale. And this large uh, raised bed outside the police station is their food growing area and they have what's known as permission to pick. You can go anywhere in the town and pick ripe fruit and vegetables and take home, eat it and use it. It's become an extraordinary initiative and they get a lot of eco-tourists visiting Todmore and to get inspired on, on what you can do and how to engage community by giving permission for people to come in and steal. As the police, the police absolutely love this. It's basically saying you have permission to come and steal from the police station. So those are some of the local initiatives that are taking place, not just in the UK, but elsewhere. And there are many we could have picked on, but time doesn't allow it. Uh, and so let's take you on now to some national urban initiatives. Uh, and you may be thinking, uh, for those who came in a bit late, but hang on a minute, I want to know what I can do on tiny spaces. We're going big and then we're going to go right back small and have a look at what it means for us. But let's get inspired by some of the big stuff that is out there. Uh, the first is a whole new initiative, and that's creating national park cities around the country and around the world. And London is one of the first ones. In London, it's about reconnecting parks together with nature corridors and bee corridors to create pollination spaces for insects, but also to create spaces for people to thoroughly enjoy uh, and not have to travel very far uh, to get to it. So, i.e. create spaces for nature that are within walking distance of everybody's house. And you can see in the background, this is one of the initiatives taking place in central, it's just in East London, and they're trying to also incorporate vertical growing onto the blocks of flats, which you can see behind. But there in the map in the top right, one of the initiatives they're doing, which is to link Scion Park, the Botanical Gardens and Ossley Park together with nature corridors, so there's much greater linkage, which means more resistance uh, during times of climate change. I'm hoping it really takes off and that we'll see other national park cities uh, springing up around the world. Many of you will be familiar with the Incredible Edible Network, which found its first days in Todmorden, as we saw at the police station. But now there are over 80 cities worldwide uh, where they are growing fruit and vegetables. Uh, and wildflowers inside the city parks and gardens and backyards and even in places where normally rubbish is dumped in little containers and little boxes and saying pick, eat, connect, reconnect with nature, reconnect with food growing, eat it and then go and replant it. It's creative spaces, spaces for permission for people to eat, enjoy and replant, and it's incredibly successful. A lot of you will be familiar with the Transition Town Network, which connects churches and sustainable waste projects, culture and community projects, zero carbon initiatives, local wildlife groups, transport groups, and the local councils together. Uh, and the little picture on the bottom, I won't take you through in detail, but it shows what's happening in Transition Town Milton Keynes, uh, not your first choice, I would say, of town spaces, but Milton Keynes is really important because many of the garden spaces are tiny. And what Transition Network says is it does not matter how small your space is, you can still be part of a bigger network. And so that is the message behind the big national schemes, is it's not about the individual size of the landholding, 
It's how you use it. It's what you use it for. It's how you transform your own space, even if it is unbelievably small, for nature, for climate, and in our case as a Christian community, obviously for God. Arosh is working closely with Forest Schools. We have par a partner in action scheme, which connects Christian landowners uh, who are working for nature and with nature at scale. And several of those have forest schools. And this is all about permission to go and enjoy, get the kids outside and passionate about nature. Now, many of us think of forest schools as countryside pursuits. Uh, but what you probably don't know is that actually over 60 percent of forest schools in the UK are in our towns. Very inspiring spaces. Uh, and if you don't have your own garden or your own backyard or your own space in a churchyard, then joining in with Forest Schools programme, either to volunteer as an adult or to inspire your kids and get them signed up is a great activity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Eco Church because earlier in the week you'll have heard from Helen Stevens, our Eco Church manager, who will have talked about the ward scheme. But we do have a massive 6,000 and something registered churches and three quarters of them nearly are in towns and cities. And so our towns and cities are winning awards for what they're doing for nature. Uh, and that's truly amazing and really exciting and hugely inspiring. So let's turn to the future. And as we go into this last section, um, I want to just slow the pace down and ask some questions of you. Uh, so just think about these for the moment. The first is, we recognize that we are in a climate crisis. That climate crisis is accelerating away at an extraordinary speed. I read data this last week that said that many of our towns and cities in the next 15 to 25 years will not be warming by one and a half Celsius, but will be warming between two and three Celsius at the current rate of change. The impacts on our native wildlife, the impacts on biodiversity, the impacts on what we plant, what we grow are already profound and will only grow in that profundity. When I was up in Scotland a few weeks ago, I realized just how fast that change is taking place. If you live in a city like Oban in West Scotland, the average temperature has already risen three degrees Celsius. What they will be able to grow and plant there now is already very different to what it was 20 years ago. And in 20 years time, who knows? So the future is all about being inspired to do things differently. The conservation and horticulture rule books have to be ripped up. What we've grown and what we've planted in our towns and cities now will be inadequate for a green, sustainable and creative future. So we have to start thinking differently. We have to think of our own little initiatives as being experimentation stations, places to try things out. And if they fail, ignore the failure and move on, learn from it. And so where we're moving to is spaces of wonder. Uh, there's a new initiative which some of you will be familiar with called Gardens of Eden. And Gardens of Eden, along with some other fledgling initiatives, the aim of them is to create extraordinary little spaces where nature can flourish and where by the type of project you're doing, you actually both lower the temperature in hot summer and lift the temperature during colder winter periods, protect the soil from storm events, uh, and don't use fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides on any occasion at all. You use the natural cycles to create incredible space. And it can be done in a tiny place, and it can be done in a large space. Here's a picture of what I would call urban food forests, and the se seven layers of a forest garden are quite simply a canopy layer, a lower tree layer, a shrub layer, a layer of herbaceous uh, shrubs, 
a soil surface, a rhizosphere, so it's what's going on underground, the root system, and then a vertical layer, which is what you're gonna grow up the side of buildings. The magic of a food forest or a food forest garden is whilst it sounds enormous and can be, it can also fit into a garden the size of a postage stamp. And so here in Southampton, in a tiny little space that I've got my call home, I've got uh, a new soil layer, which I'm trying to compost. I've got a new herb layer and then I've got fruiting trees and so on. Uh, and every now and again, I do get the neighbours coming around and saying, your blackberries are going through my fence. But it is creating a new small space for nature. And so could we collectively be committed to creating a food forest in our church, in our churchyard? If we don't have access to a garden or a churchyard, what about a raised box where you can do a mini version? The minute you create pollinating flowers, you create a source of food for bees and then as a result for birds and as a result for mammals. The minute you create something that has a food growing potential, you are feeding people. Think about how you could transform towns and cities and communities if we were all doing this. And if our church spaces and cathedral spaces became places of wonder rather than just spaces of mown grass and gravestones. I have nothing against mown grass and gravestones, as long as they're incorporated into something beautiful and creative that really takes into account the biodiversity's cry for help and the need to hit our climate objectives of change and hope. And if the scale of a food forest doesn't inspire, then let's take it down one level further. And here's two other ideas to think about. The first is what we call patio pots. So this is just an example of one company and please don't get this wrong, I'm not advertising Sutton's, but it is a great example where you can buy pots with wildflowers sewn into them and you literally water it and you get your own flourishing pot of wildflowers and if they're perennials or they're annuals with seeds, you can then plant it out. Uh, so it's a brilliant way of creating a space for nature and indeed a place of hope, even if you don't have a yard. You've just got a windowsill and that is all it is. And in the worst case scenario, you don't have any space outside at all. You live in a tower block. You plant it on your windowsill. You open your window and you allow the insects in to pollinate it. Result, you are doing your bit for nature, for climate and for the future. And we could all do that. There's not nobody here who couldn't do that in some way, shape or form. And then seed bombing. Now, some of the purest ecologists out there, and I am an ecologist, but I've increasingly thought, well, do you know what? It's time to do some direct action. And so you didn't hear it from me, but if you find a nice community space, is looking rather boring and you happen to have some wildflowers in the sea bomb uh, and they're non-invasive species uh, if you quietly throw a bomb in there um, and then watch over the next few months to see what happens i didn't say do it did i i didn't advise it but sea bombs can be fun as long as they come from reputable sources there's nothing worse than throwing sea bombs into places that destroy wildflower areas that are already there or contain invasive species. So done with care, it can be a fantastic community initiative. And right around the world now, there are urban organisations dedicated just to creating spaces for wildlife and wonder from churchyards to people's back gardens. Groups like the Urban Wildlife Trust, Global Bird Rescue, which is helping big cities to create new spaces and gardens for nature and stop things, birds banging into windows. The London Wildlife Trust. And the picture on the right is, is a Karoo. This is a New Zealand initiative in cities to count Karoo, uh, a bird that's endangered. So all sorts of fun initiatives. So let's go right back then to what can we do as individuals? And hopefully I've already given you some ideas. But the key for me is that change is absolutely possible. 
We can make our urban areas climate proof, edible, rich in biodiversity. To do so, we need to learn more, research, read, talk to the experts, watch programs on permaculture, food growing, biodiversity, ecology, get inspired, uh, read books and talk to each other. Change is absolutely vital too. We're called to be a people of direct action. And by this, I'm not necessarily referring to gluing yourself to the M25, but this is all about gathering people who are like-minded into spaces to create hope for nature and hope for the future. And change is happening. We are all leaders and inspirers. We can all be leaders and inspirers in this. I long to see the church continuing to take a lead uh, and being church in the community. Our gardens can be spaces of worship. We're not worshipping nature, but we're worshipping Jesus in nature. Our wild spaces in our towns can be places where people find God for the first time. We're not selling God to them. We're just enabling people to enjoy space and reconnecting with God through nature. And as I said, it's not about individual areas. Individual areas are largely irrelevant. It's about connectivity, connecting small spaces together for people and nature. So we're nearly at the end of this talk, um, but I want to just show a couple of slides to finish with. The first is what I call my eight things that we can all do to make it happen. So here's some ideas of things that we practically can all do, uh, either individually in our home with our garden, or if we don't have a garden, in our churchyard, or if we don't have a churchyard, in our community. So number one, let it grow. Keep at least half of your garden, your pots, your beds, your yard space wild. Allow things to go wild. Brilliant for pest control, brilliant for pollinating insects, fantastic space for nature. Let it flower. Don't cut grass before late summer if you can. So have areas of long grass, and if it's in an area where people are gonna complain, We've, as Arosha, got signs that we can send you that are really fun that say why it's growing long. If it doesn't flower very well, seed some yellow rattle in uh, after you've done a grass cut so that the grass can be uh, parasitized by a plant that will make the nutrients fall and allow wildflowers in. And don't forget to take your grass cuttings off because they act as a fertilizer. If you're trying to create wildflowers, you do not want lots of grass mowings uh, on the lawn or in your churchyard. And let it produce. Do plant vegetables and fruit seeds from what you buy. And why not have a seed planting nursery in your churchyard where you encourage on one Sunday all your congregation to bring in seeds from what they've eaten the week before um, and taken out of so when you've eaten an apple take the pits out when you've eaten tomato take the pits out and creating your own food growing area based on what you've eaten and plants of birds and mammals to enjoy too and let it sing put up a range of bird boxes to provide homes for nature from house martin boxes on the outside of your house or tower block right the way through to boxes on your trees let it get wet we don't all need massive wetlands but we can create mini wetlands, spaces with mud to play in for animals, mini pond areas. We can let it shine and harness energy from the sun and wind to create your own power, even if it's only a couple of solar lights outside. We can let it hide and create bug boxes and hotels and dead wood piles for our desperate insects to hide in winter and hibernate and to enjoy eating in summer and let it create developing composts and mulches to create your own soil and fertilizer. And there's lots of advice online as to how to create compost heaps and how to create successful urban mulches. So that's the small scale. And then this is what I call my little manifesto for change in urban spaces. And it's what can communities do? Every new house building project that goes on needs to be creating new habitats for nature. Every new home that's built could have a bird or a bat box. Every home and church have gardens or wild pots or raised beds. Even in the smallest church, it's possible to have wild pots or a raised bed. It's doable. 
So we should all be doing it. And every community to have a wild space dedicated for nature, meditation, prayer, access to food growing for local people together. Great witnessing tool. And if it's led by the church, my gosh, it can have impact. Every conservation organisation to focus efforts on rewilding in neglected urban areas rather than the really attractive rural ones. Every park to have a wild space for nature over the next few years, not a single park to be left as golf course mown grass. Every council to have wildflowers on half of its roadsides at least, saves a lot of money and it's brilliant to bring down temperatures and protect soil and deal with pollution. And every town to focus on a 10% increase in tree cover, focusing on pollinating species, fruit growing species, native species. Every city to have an urban nature ambassador, somebody who can connect community to council, to government, to work together to transform our towns, villages and city communities. Um, and finally, um, I can't read that last one because I've got a, a block on there, but you can see the last point on there. <laughs> So let us move on to a few inspirational pictures to end with. Uh, the first is Lu Zhao. And this is a vision of what's possible. We're back in China and their mission is to create a city of 30,000 people uh, to uh, sequester 10,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide every year and produce over 910 tonnes of oxygen. This city is being built as we speak, and it will create vertical and horizontal growing spaces for people and for nature, and it will blend in to the forest that already exists. This is perhaps a vision of what cities of the future might be able to look like. From a climate point of view, also amazing. Do you know that Lu Zhao is likely to have a temperature that's four degrees lower in summer than on the surrounding area? Uh, and that's because of the impacts of plant life really being able to create shade and soak up some of the sunlight prevent, re prevented reflecting. And Nanjing, there's a vertical city where they are rewilding their blocks of flats. And this exists already and it's doing the impossible and absolutely making it happen. Making our cities sing again for nature even in the tiniest spaces, it's possible. Now, I do apologize for putting in a politically motivated picture, but I just, it just made me smile because one of the things that happened here was I was involved with a tree planting program with David Cameron in Oxfordshire uh, just a week before, he, a couple of weeks before he resigned. And one of the things that really struck me was he was truly, truly inspired at what could be achieved for urban use. This is a, uh, an area of, it was an area of very damaged farmland on the edge of a, a major town in Oxfordshire. Uh, and it's now being transformed into a multi-space community and eco project run by Christians um, to inspire and equip urban youth uh, to come and enjoy and take part in projects that restore nature. Uh, this is David Cameron's tree, and, and he just said, you know, I really feel like I've caught the fire of what could be possible. And so it is possible to inspire and equip our leaders and lead by example and show what can be achieved. It is really a season for interdependency. We are so dependent on nature for our food. Biodiversity is now very dependent on us for helping to bring it into a better space for people, uh, for the climate, for, uh, for nature itself. Nature is not groaning. Nature is screaming out in pain for change and for wanting to work with us to create something incredible new, imaginative, small and yet at scale, where we're all doing something and building part of a huge jigsaw of hope and inspiration. And so as we come to the end of this talk and uh, I'm aware that we are, our time is pretty much up, uh, we'll finish a couple of minutes early, which is, is good. I want to just read this quote from Walter Brueggemann. 
We are a people serving a God of abundance, but in a time of scarcity. That journey from anxious scarcity through miraculous abundance to a neighborly common good has been peculiarly entrusted to the church. And that neighborly common good 15, even 10 years ago in the church was considered a neighborliness to ourselves in our church and in our immediate community. But now it extends very definitely to the whole of creation. We are called to be a people celebrating the miraculous abundance of the whole of creation and making it happen. And unless we are prepared to serve in this space and get our hands and feet dirty uh, and really walk out of our church doors and into the space around and be Christ's hands and feet, then we are missing the biggest opportunity of a generation to transform people, to transform places, to transform nature and to transform the climate. So this is a season of abundant life. This is a season of miraculous hope. This is a season of illustrating neighborly common good. This is a season for ripping up the rule books. This is a season for imagination, a season for creativity, a season to weep and lament together and then turn it into fields of flower filled joy. And I absolutely believe that collectively as a faith community, we can do this together. Catherine, I will pass back to you and I will stop uh, sharing. Thank you so much for that, Andy. There's some incredibly inspiring examples there. Um, we're pretty tight on time, so we're going to have to try and take at least a couple of the questions and then I'm afraid that we won't have time for them all. Um, Going back to your wolf hole site at the beginning, wolf fields? Wolf yeah, hole. wolf fields, yeah. Fields. Um, <laughs> did you have any issue creating food growing space given how contaminated the site had been? And I, maybe you can take that a little bit more broadly and, and help people think about whether they might need to be concerned about contamination if they're planting out. Yeah, so uh, the first thing is you must always, so if you're creating food growing area, you have to test soils. You can get soil testing kits and make sure you, you're not faced with heavy metals or any nasty pollutants. But the simplest solution on highly contaminated sites is the creation of raised beds, uh, creating your own compost, then creating your own soil and mulch, or bringing in peat-free compost uh, to, to create the space. So that's the simplest solution. If you're struggling with costs, bring in soil from outside, just make sure it's peat-free. Uh, two different people who've asked a very similar question about do you have any suggestions for really small spaces in the middle of concreted urban areas and someone else has mentioned you know if we've only got a car park and no greenery um, where do people start in that circumstance? So the easiest way to start is exactly the picture I showed earlier of the wild flower pot the sudden seed pot the starting point with nature is always if you've got no space at all there will still be a space for creating pots of joy, as I would put it, creating a space where you can plant wildflowers in tiny pots and it will still provide a pollination service for insects. And of course, then it works its way up the food chain. So there's no such thing as too small. Uh, and that's a great starting point. The other great starting point on nest boxes is if you don't have a tree, you don't have a bush, but you do have a wall, then putting up boxes for house martins, for example, or swifts, urban birds that rely on the sides of buildings like the sides of cliffs. Uh, and we can we can all do that, too. So there are small steps that we can take that are easy to do, easy to implement uh, and take away from the fact that we may not have any horizontal space of any significance for nature. Um, so Comment really rather than a question from Peter. People, people object to compost heaps because they attract rats. Um, any quick thought on that? Yeah, if you create a great compost heap and you have a, a grass snake move in, it'll eat the rats. So that will solve your rat problem. Uh, so it can work uh, with the absolute opposite effect. The, the biggest challenge with compost heap is that there are a lot of things that you can throw on it that won't attract rats. The problem comes with peelings of vegetables specifically there are certain vegetables and certain fruit cores as they rot they will attract vermin so the answer is 
pot them into boxed compost uh, so that the rats can't get in and then uh, then use that separately. So in other words, the big open compost heaps in an area where you know there are rats, that might not be good for fruit and vegetables, but you could still create compost there, but use pot potted compost and your garden centre will be able to advise on the best ones and they, they enable more sealed units that are then uh, rat proof. Very good. And uh, the final thing is really just a comment is someone saying, I already fling wildflower seeds and plant wildflower plants in my wild. <laughs> my daughter calls it gorilla gardening. Um, I, I, I feel the urge to put one caveat on that, having been to the earlier webinar about flower rich grasslands in our churchyards, that in a churchyard, we're really trying to encourage the native wildflowers to regrow rather than introducing annuals. Yep. So, so be very mindful about where you're putting your uh, your wildflower bombs. I would, I would, I would agree with that. I would also add to it that we are going to be going into a season where, in some areas, the native species are simply no longer going to thrive because of climate change, and so a lot of conservation groups are scratching their heads at this point and going, well, we need to be creative. And that does mean that in some spaces, we will have to start introducing non-natives that are non-invasive, but that are wildlife rich. And so the space over the next 10 years in terms of the conservation journey as organizations will be shifting. Uh, but I would advocate exactly what Catherine says. If you've got native wildflowers already, there is absolutely no need to sow into it anything that's non-native. But watch this space, because the journey for the conservation movement is about to go through its biggest change in a, in a generation. That seems like the moment to end. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you for all Pleasure. the inspiration that you've brought us today from the small scale to the large. Thank you to everyone who's joined us for today's webinar. We've got one left at four o'clock today. Please do come along to that. Um, and after we've finished late this afternoon, I'll send everybody the slides and the links from the chat. Thank you for coming along and I'll bring us to a close. Goodbye. <laughs>